we're on air. So <laughs> welcome to our first Google Plus Hangout for our Maxwell Project nutrition coaching session. And we have Blakely Page here today, a registered dietitian out of Kansas City, Missouri, who is a phenomenal human being, um, soon to be mom, and somebody who is very, very familiar with the functional medicine world and using food to heal. So I know Blakely, you work with, with children from all different backgrounds, and we're excited to hear from you today. Thank you so much for being with us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. I'm so glad to be here. This is such a fun connection and <clears throat> just love that I get to be a part of you all's network. So um, like Audra said, I've been a dietitian for about seven years here in the Kansas City area and it was really my personal journey and the journey of my family that moved me more towards the holistic side. So I am a registered dietitian, so trained um, practically in the normal medical model um, calories in, calories out, eat your veggies, um, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But when I was, um, it's almost been two and a half, almost three years ago, that I was sick and tired and gaining weight and doing all the things that a dietitian should be doing, but it wasn't working. And I was watching weight loss um, clients, not mine specifically, because I was actually in a clinical setting, but watching our outpatient dietitian work with weight loss and these women were eating next to nothing, exercising aggressively and still gaining weight. And most dietitians, unfortunately, just think that they're lying to them. That, you know, well, they must not know how to count their calories. They must not know how to do portion sizes. They must be lying to me about what they're eating. And it just was so unfortunate because it, it just felt like nobody was getting anywhere. Nobody was getting help. Nobody was getting healthier. And everybody was just getting frustrated with each other. So when I started to tackle my own polycystic ovarian syndrome, that led me down the path of really looking at a paleo template and looking at a more holistic model that said we can do more with food than what dietitians were taught and what I knew. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I had an incredible, incredible network of more functionally minded holistic dietitians that were kind of pioneering and navigating the world of supplementation in Kansas City. And I kind of ebbed and flowed out of their group, um, just kind of depending on what season of life and what type of job I was in at the time, but really kind of honed in on their expertise and their knowledge and just started learning. And I've seen tremendous effects um, in the health, in my own health, um, was able to get off all medications, was just able to really dive into what it looks like to use real food to heal um, and to use food to nourish instead of just feed our bodies. At the same time, um, about it was actually October of last year my mom started having um, some pretty aggressive back pain and was diagnosed with lymphoma mm -hmm. and so we began kind of the cancer journey prior to that she had kind of come she realized that she had some auto autoimmune diseases we were working on going gluten-free we were kind of my dad is diabetic and he was willing to go gluten-free my sister was having babies that were reacting, and so they were going gluten-free. So it was kind of a family journey that my immediate family was willing to be on, not only with me, but also to trust my expertise as I was learning and still in process of kind of getting my bearings in the functional medicine world. Long story short, um, just actually found out today that my mom has a clear PET scan after only four chemo treatments. Wow. Yeah. Hey. So we have not heard any official report from the doctor. My dad, being the man that he is, went to the um, cancer center and picked up the copy of the report before the doctor had called them about the results. And so they read their report, but they have not talked to the doctor. So, you know, we're holding that loosely as far as what the next step will be. But in July, from July to October, um, the cancer's gone. Yay. And through that process, she has had really aggressive, holistic, functional medicine support, which I kind of got her started with, but really a holistic MD in her area was able to carry the ball and pair holistic, um, aggressive nutrition support with her chemo regimen in ways that were not in contradictory to each other. Told her exactly how many days to stay off her probiotic right after chemo and when to start it back again. All those... Um, all those higher level things that I just wasn't qualified to do. And so we were just so grateful for that team. Um, but we would not be where we are had we not, had I not been getting sick and tired and changed the way that I was thinking about nutrition and relearned essentially what I was taught in school. And 
that has meant um, a world of difference for the kids that I see because I'm working with kids with special needs, some with um, some with cancer, some most without, but with developmental delays, gastrointestinal issues, they're just sick kids. And um, the functional medicine route has been um, saving them. It's been changing their behavior. It's been, I mean, I had a mom a few weeks ago say I have a totally new kid. And that was just from getting off dairy. You wow. know, that was one relatively small in the big scope of things intervention. It was just dairy. Mm. Um, and so we're seeing really profound effects with just going back to real food. So that's kind of where mm. I come from and where I am. And you'll hear more kind of in my paradigm and, you know, how far left or right I'm willing to go with nutrition <laughs> as we answer mm. questions. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so Thank much, Blakely. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And what we're trying to do with these coaching sessions, because this is really a nutrition coaching session, and I just want to make clear that you're not providing any medical advice, and you're not somebody's MD, yeah. you're not someone's oncologist, <laughs> and so we're all very clear about that, that this is, this is coaching, this is something that we all need access to, which is really a community of support and of hope for our families. And you're able to answer questions not based on knowing their medical hit the child's medical history or anything like that but you know based on some essential principles and things that as parents we just don't know as much about and so you yeah. hold the key to some of those principles to help our family so we really really appreciate that and the fact that you're willing to step up and do some coaching yeah. and not everybody is because they're afraid of the liability and how things could get misconstrued but I know we're all taking a do no harm approach to food and to wellness, which means we're only talking about things that can help um, yeah. one way or the other. And then, in the case that someone needs to really speak with an oncologist or a doctor about it, you know, we're, I know we've always been clear about that. And I know you are as well. So I just wanted to put that out there since this will be recorded. And <laughs> I thought that today we could start with um, one of our amazing, incredible moms who's here with us, um, with Erin, Cade's mom. Hello. With some of her questions, and then we'll move on to some of the questions from our folks online that they posted. And just to make clear, we do have a chat function um, here. If you go up to the left, there's a little, right under the add a person box, there is a little chat box, and it pops up a little group chat section on the right. So if we want to chat while talking is going on, that's an easy way to do it. And um, so let me hand it over to Erin. Erin, let's talk about the questions that you have. Thank you so much for your introduction, Blakely. It's great. I, I've been on, um, my son has a pilocytic astrocytoma and also suffered a stroke. And for me personally, the one thing in an out of control new normal was food. I, that's something I've really gone after because it's something that I can control and can help with my family and help heal. Um, so with my journey, I'm. It, it can be frustrating sometimes because our, our budget has tripled. I mean, not our budget, our spending has tripled. <laughs> not our budget. Um, <laughs> we wish. That's the problem. Yeah. So I've been really trying to do some things that help with that. But I guess one of my questions is you hear so much different things about dairy and, you know, gluten and, and I don't know, I wanted to get your input, is that something for everybody you would say cut dairy? Mm -hmm. And if that is, uh, what about raw dairy? Yeah, fabulous question. Um, let me start with the gluten and then I'll talk about the dairy. Okay. Um, because the gluten, I think everybody should be off gluten, hands down, no matter what. I really have not come across a scenario where anyone thrives with it. Um, I have only come across scenarios where people thrive without it. People survive with it, obviously. You know, most of us have for a long time or are currently. Mm -hmm. um, but the way our wheat is today is not the wheat that we grew up eating. Mm -hmm. Around the 70s, it started to change as they continued to hybridize it for good reason and for higher yield and nothing malicious or ill-intended. It's just the wheat is not the same. And our bodies are not recognizing it, and it's causing inflammation in everybody. And so um, I am confident enough about that and professionally um, willing to say I don't think anyone needs gluten. Okay. And like I said before, I see people surviving on it but not thriving on it. And the uh -huh. goal with food is to thrive, obviously. The goal with food, the goal with our whole lives is to thrive. 
And that's a small area of life that really inhibits a lot, a lot of people. I mean, I just today saw a girl who's 20-something, and she was has had multiple surgeries, had a burst appendix, and was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And really, essentially, we took the gluten out, and she's, she's healing in tremendous ways. And, you know, we took other things out too, but that was the main deal. And she feels the worst when she has the gluten. Mm -hmm. And it's been the demise of the health of my family, personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the more kids I see, the more clients I see, the more stories I read, nobody's doing well on it. So I am willing to say, even on a recording, everybody mm -hmm. should be off gluten. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then as far as dairy goes, I think most people um, don't do as well with dairy as they think they do. But a lot of people do still tolerate dairy. I don't think that it is as aggressively harmful as the gluten. The catch is what type of dairy, what's your source, pasteurized or raw. So um, typically when I'm trying to navigate what is someone reacting to and what they aren't, what are they not reacting to, what's their threshold for some of these foods, We'll take those foods out, sometimes just gluten and dairy, sometimes the top seven main allergens, take them out and begin to add them, and then add them back in, do a challenge, and see how they do. Mm -hmm. That's typically where I go with dairy, is let's take it out for a month or two, even three months would be ideal, and then start to add back in one category of dairy at a time and see how you react. Mm -hmm. um, then we know, we actually know instead of just guessing. Mm -hmm. You can do food sensitivity testing. I think there's some great testing out there. It's still not going to be as good as an elimination diet. It's, you're still mm -hmm. going to get the most information and the most knowledge of what your body is doing by taking out a food, letting your body regroup, take a break, heal a little bit, and adding it back in and see if you have an effect. Mm -hmm. So that's the general scope of dairy. Pasteurized dairy, I'll talk a little bit now about pasteurized versus raw. So pasteurized dairy um, is the pasteurization process kills all of the live enzymes, so you no longer have a live food. It's, a, it's considered a dead food. Um, there's nothing live or active in it. You get your calcium and vitamin D at some level. You get your protein, but all of the enzymes that cause that food to be alive are gone from the pasteurization. The second key to our traditional milk is the homogenization. So the homogenization actually presses through a, kind of a mechanical process, presses the, the fat that rises to the top in your, in your whole milk. You know, if you had raw milk, you'd have cream at the top and milk at the bottom. Mm. It presses that fat into, um, into the milk, changing the molecular structure so that that fat and milk don't separate. Well, mm. there's research that shows that that change in the molecular structure changes how our body responds to the milk. And so when they put, you know, a drop of raw milk under a microscope and a drop of pasteurized milk under the, and homogenized milk under a microscope, they're totally different molecules. Mm -hmm. And so our bodies don't respond to them the same. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that the fat in that milk is really important. So low-fat dairy is low-fat pasteurized dairy is the thing that I work with most people of getting rid of first. Because we don't get any benefit from our dairy if the fat's not there. That yeah. cream and that full fat is actually beneficial. And that, you know, could lead us down a rabbit trail of the whole heart-healthy saturated fat conversation. But we won't go there right now unless the question comes up. But mm -hmm. um, full fat dairy um, is the place to, to, to move the mindset, even if we're not willing to get rid of the pasteurization homogenized dairy. Mm -hmm. So then raw dairy obviously is unpasteurized, non-homogenized. Um, it's straight from your farm. It's full fat. Your cream's going to rise to the top. It's a beautiful, live, functional food. Mm -hmm. It has purpose. It has benefit. Um, we've been ingrained to be so scared of it that mm -hmm. it clearly is not popular. It's illegal in most states to sell it um, or to promote the sales of it. Mm -hmm. um, if a handful of states you can buy it in stores, but most states it's illegal to promote the sale, the sales of raw milk. Mm -hmm. That fear really started when 
the confinement, the confinement dairy operations were getting so big that the cows were sick, mm. and they weren't taking good care of their cows, and so the milk was toxic. The milk wasn't mm. as safe to drink. People were getting sick at some level. Then the guy who created the first pasteurization machine was a brilliant salesman, and he went door to door literally with fear tactics, convincing people that they will get sick or die from their raw milk that their families had been, you know, drinking for generations. Hmm. And so there's kind of a there's a little bit of a political historical background to why raw milk was so villainized. Hmm. Um, with that said, there is a risk to drinking raw milk. It is a live product. It is, it is full of probiotics. It's full of bacteria. Most people really thrive in that good bacteria. It's considered a probiotic source and they do really well with raw milk. Um, I tend to lean towards go dairy free, like I said before, go dairy free. If you're going to add anything back and your choice is the raw milk, let's go that route. Use the full fat um, and see how you tolerate it. Um, there are people who say, who still do not tolerate the raw milk, um, especially um, milk because if you can be really acnogenic, a lot of people that's controversial. You know, your dermatologist will tell you your milk is not causing your acne. There's no food that causes your acne, etc. But if you think about the hormone level of a cow when they're producing milk, she just had a baby. You know, that cow's hormone level is really really high, mm. and that's going to be present in that milk. If you think of breast milk. Then, and you think of your hormones right after you had a baby, they're off the charts. And so there is a connection between the hormone effect of milk, um, and there's a couple specific molecules that that includes. Um, if I try to say them, I get it wrong. But um, there's a couple components of the milk that can be inflammatory for some people. So you might hear in some camps, you know, probably, you know, leaning towards the Weston A. Price Foundation side that raw milk is a perfect food. Um, in many respects, it's a, it's a perfect food for a baby calf. It's a almost, it's a, it can be a really beneficial food to us, okay? So you've got the other side of the camp that says, well, you know, we should all be dairy-free. We're the only species that drinks another species' milk. Mm -hmm. Well, just because that's true doesn't mean that the milk from another species wouldn't be helpful or be beneficial, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so I think there are um, – the main thing with raw milk is that it's live, it's active, it can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, the secondary thing is that there is a risk to drinking raw milk. Some of the, Sometimes I'll say there's a risk to drinking raw milk and there's a risk to not drinking raw milk because you don't yeah. get that powerful food, but at the same yeah. time – you don't get the risk of bacteria. I mean, a naturopath that I see, she has seen people get sick from raw milk. She saw, you know, one of her patients was pregnant and got sick from drinking raw milk. Um, so there's a risk there, you know. Um, but majority of the people who are going to drink raw milk are going to know their farmers, they're going to have visited that farm, and they're going to trust that farm. So when thinking about raw milk, I like to lean, I like to steer people towards farms and farmers who have a closed herd, first of all. So that means that they breed within their same herd. So the farmer's not going out and buying new cattle every mm -hmm. season and introducing new things to that herd. Mm -hmm. so I like the idea of having a closed herd. The second thing is a closed milking system. So, I mean, you're not, these systems are pretty sophisticated where the cows are really taken care of well, but it's not this open pail of milk being sloshed up to the house. You know, they have closed systems that they're milking into that give you a really clean, sanitary product. Um, at the end of the day, it's you got to build that relationship with your farmer. you got to trust where your, milk, where your milk's coming from because then you're willing to take the risk if something did happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, even, Blakely, even if, if we're in the situation where um, you might have an immunosuppressed child, for example, mm -hmm. in, in one of these situations, especially when they're on chemo and their ANC is at zero, I think probably their doctor is going to be like, I mean, our doctor wouldn't even approve probiotics, which we right. use. Um, <laughs> so that's one of the things where, you know, really getting to know kind of what your threshold might be with that and then the difference between a child on treatment and off treatment. Mm -hmm. But let's say you were going to um, use a, you know, pasteurized product 
Mm -hmm. um, would, would you think then the next step down from raw would be please, please, please use a grass-fed organic product? And we know how expensive these things are, but right. to get as, as close to that point of the same sort of thing where we're a little bit more kind of in touch with at least having, you know, not just humanely raised um, animals, hopefully, but also um, high, higher in omega-3s in the, in the Absolutely. composition, things mm -hmm. like that. Yep, that's a that's a perfect um, balance of um, doing. So okay, let me let me go back to the idea of, of kids in treatment. Um, if I if I was looking at a kid in treatment currently doing chemo, mm -hmm. I honestly would not be looking at the raw milk. I would be looking at your cleanest, freshest, best source of pasteurized milk, um, preferably non homogenized. There are some that are pasteurized but non homogenized, yep. and so I really like that idea. The Kalana brand is fabulous. Um, it's I think it's the it's I think it's K O L A N A or something to that effect. Um, and I I know it's available here. I don't know. I know that there's plenty. There's probably more options than we have here um, in California. Yeah, we, we have them here. You can get um I'm it's the big organic brand here does a I mean so you can get Strauss here from okay. Northern California and they're they're fabulous. And then the, even a bigger organic brand does a non homogenized grass fed organic. They do a grass-fed organic um, cheese, uh, I'm sorry, a butter even, and you can only get it six months out of the year. But Perfect. there are, are these products available now. Right. That's what I would be using. And, of course, the full fat. We're not, we're not doing anything low fat with any of those products. That's what I would be using when well tolerated. Um, and then, so, then the other step is the most, the dairy that's typically best tolerated by almost, by most people is a fermented dairy. And so that's where you could actually be using your pasteurized milk to make homemade yogurt. And then you're getting a balance of we know that this we know that this yogurt or that this product is not going to have the high level of risk that raw milk might have for a kid undergoing treatment. The risk for what could go wrong with making homemade yogurt, I think, is so much lower. And I've been making, you know, yogurt for a long time. Um, not a long time. Throughout this last year, <laughs> I've been making yogurt um, and had no problems at all. Now, my mom, while she was on chemo, she simply didn't feel comfortable doing it. Once she's finished with treatment, she's, that's going to be the way that she eats her, her dairy, um, but she just personally didn't feel like she could trust herself and didn't want the risk of accidentally introducing something that was going to be pathogenic to her without realizing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that was her choice. You know, I don't know what I would do if I was the mom of that kid. I honestly can't tell you how I'd feel about that. Um, because, again, I think that there's that balance of when you are making your own yogurt, you have the option of introducing bacteria to that mm. product that otherwise wouldn't be there. Mm. Granted, you sanitize everything, you boil everything, you have a clean environment. I mean, there's at the same time, you're using your bacteria and you're using your local normal environment, which I think can be really powerful for the immune system. So, um, especially when reintroducing dairy, so if someone's been dairy free and they're reintroducing, my first suggestion for reintroduction is a homemade 24-hour fermented dairy. And I typically go with a pasteurized milk for that, um, especially for families who are kind of transitioning into that or who are not, you know, going to be on board with raw milk or it's just not appropriate or easy for them. Then we use a pasteurized, non-homogenized milk mm -hmm. and use a commercial, organic, grass-fed, high-quality, full-fat yogurt as the starter culture or you order a starter culture from some place like Cultures for Health or Wise Choice Market, and you use your powder yogurt starter that way. The catch with the or the key with that is a 24-hour fermentation. So most commercial yogurts are fermented six to eight hours, but to get that really powerful food that we can, we culture all the way for 24 hours. Um, and so that's where you get the yogurt. The homemade yogurt is a, is a more powerful food than what you're going to buy at the store. Um, and that's where I like to go as, first of all, as a reintroduction, also as a balance between a beneficial dairy product versus a dead dairy product versus 
a potentially mm -hmm. slightly higher risk raw product. So that's kind of where I've landed with an effective kind of happy medium between those seemingly extremes, especially mm -hmm. when you're looking at an immunosuppressed kid. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is, that's amazing, Blakely. That was like such a thorough description. That was awesome. Um, we are, and I know Anna has more questions than when I want to get to that, but related to the dairy thing, I know that we think a lot about milk when we think of dairy, and I know I've told you that with Max right now, we're on the ketogenic diet, and yeah. so it's been a, a crazy process for me because we're doing it with him, and I thought that I was lactose intolerant. I was convinced before we went on this diet that I was lactose intolerant, and I had tr I thought I had like kind of moved things out enough to try it. So we go off all grains and all car. I mean, we have a tiny amount of carbs come from like a couple of raspberries in the day or whatever, mm -hmm. and all symptoms are gone. Mm -hmm. I'm eating more dairy than I've ever eaten before or or consumed. I don't use yeah. milk, however, we use sure. almond milk. I don't the milk is too high in sugar, so it's mostly yeah. cheese really high fat yogurt and really um, just the high fat um, grass fed cream and butter mm -hmm. and I'm not remotely bloated and I never get any gas or anything yeah. I'm going from being super bloated and I'm thinking like you know I know kind of like we don't really produce lactase you know much as we as we get older and we don't process mm -hmm. milk that much and I'm wondering if the process in the enzymatic processes of and of creating cheeses renders a slightly different dairy product than a, a milk product and should we again look at doing raw cheeses and things like that as well does this did, did this apply to cheese um, mm -hmm. also for you yeah that's a great question all that does apply to cheese so again where very few people tolerate a plain glass of regular milk very well these days even if they're not willing to admit it <laughs> many people will tolerate um, your fermented dairy and your hard cheeses. Yep. So with your hard cheeses your lactose content is really low um, also your casein content is really low and that's typically so in your dairy you've got whey and you've got casein those are your two proteins that are in that make up the dairy. Mm -hmm. The casein is typically what people are reacting to if they're dairy intolerant um, or if they're allergic to dairy it's typically the casein. The full the higher the fat that you get um, and the harder the cheese, the less casein is there. So when you have moved to ketogenic, your fat content of those of those products went up, and your casein level went down. Mm. And so that's probably where your good tolerance is coming from. Um, and a lot of people, and then the raw cheeses, I think, are a fabulous idea, especially your commercial raw cheeses. They are um, low temp pasteurized. So there's some level of safety there, but they're still they've got some activity to them. Okay. And so um, your raw cheeses, your harder cheeses, and then that full heavy cream um, can really be tolerated well by by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and even with your ketogenic, um, if you are, is Max currently? He's he's still doing chemo. No, he's not. He's off treatment right now. Okay, that's what I thought. So um, another family that I have that's using keto for um, seizures, yeah. she does use raw milk, and she'll separate out the curds in the whey, so she'll clabber the milk, so let it sour, and then strain out the curds to the top, and so basically she's got full fat fermented um, cheese curds. Awesome. And she's been wow. flavoring that a little bit, and her son's 16, and he loves the stuff. She's, she can't keep enough of it. That's amazing. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's something. And then the whey separates to the bottom and drips out. And you can use your whey to culture other things. So you can use your whey to make fermented veggies, to um, soak oats, you know, and ferment oats to make them easier to digest. Or obviously you guys won't be doing oats or you'd have like two of them. But um, <laughs> for other purposes. So um, especially to do some cultured veggies. You, you you can separate the whey out from that raw milk after it's soured because soured raw milk is just a stronger probiotic. It's not toxic like soured pasteurized milk would be. Mm. And so you can get a really, you can get a fermented full fat, you know, cheese curd cream and then you can get whey that you use to ferment veggies or do all kinds of other things with. Those are Western A. Price principles and they're um, 
YouTube videos, their um, cookbooks, you know, the Sally Fallon cookbook, etc. Um, Wise Tra- or uh, I forgot the name of it, Wise Traditions or something like that. Um, those are where all those recipes are. They're all over the internet. Um, you know, how to make whey or how to make you know, cultured cream cheese. So essentially what you have is cultured cream cheese is essentially what you have. And then you may choose to flavor it some way or just, you know, get used to the sour flavor. Um, but anytime you're culturing those things, just pay attention to your culture time and, and do that. I mean, I, I have made myself sick by soaking oats um, in homemade yogurt and letting it sit out too long. And so you still, you are dealing with live bacteria, so you do have to pay attention to those things. But the the practices and the way of doing it have been um, revived from our grandparents and great grandparents era, where they ate cultured foods all the time and were so much better for it. And we've modernized some of those practices and some of the ways that we do that. And those, there's lots of resources out there. So there's and some other ideas, but yeah, your full fat dairy and your cheeses are much better tolerated because that casein level is lower. And there's all this research I saw on NPR about our the deficits in our biome in the in our um, gastrointestinal biome and the fact that we are also at this point looking at doing you know like um like a transplants and right. you know making sure to replenish those guts with what with what we you know have lost in this process. So I think that there are fascinating intersections with that, and they're really looking at you know immune therapies that have to do with those replacements. This is, this is an awesome conversation. I haven't heard a lot of this. I have heard of the, I think it's the Weston A. Price Foundation. Correct? Yeah. Correct? yeah. They have a lot of resources online as well. Um, and I know that, Aaron, you had two other questions that I know you posted online. Um, so let's, let's talk. One was about food pairings, and the other was about honey. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if this is another segue or if you want to talk about it another time, but going with the dairy part is, you know, it seems like more and more people are moving to almond milk and Mm -hmm. coconut milk. And sometimes I understand from the sugar content, you know, that part of it. But as far as nutritional value, do you think that that, I mean, thinking about families who have younger kids that still like cereal and things like that, Mm -hmm. is that something that you find to be helpful? I I do find them to be very helpful, those dairy alternatives. Um, primarily with children that need that milk replacement, not nutritionally, but socially and, um, for, and culturally, you know, that they need yeah. something in that cup, uh-huh. uh, or the cereal or that type of thing. Okay. Um, I lean more towards the coconut milk, mm-hmm. although most people like the almond milk better. I lean Mm -hmm. towards the coconut milk because you get your medium train fatty acids. um, You Mm -hmm. get the power of your coconut in there. Mm -hmm. um, And you don't have to worry about any of the nut allergies um, associated with it. Most people like the almond milk better, and kids tend to transition a little bit better to the almond milk. Um, The thing that I try to avoid with the almond milk is the carrageen. Um, It's it's a thickener type thing that's natural, Um, but they use it as a thickener and it's showing up to be a little bit hard on the gut and to kind of break down that gut wall a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's some brands that have the carrageen, some brands that don't. And then I always try to steer parents to the unsweetened versions of Mm -hmm. the almond milk. Um, because you can really get a pretty high sugar content with the regular one. They have a vanilla unsweetened, which Uh is vanilla and, you know, it's perfectly, uh, it's a good balance if the unsweetened yeah. is just too much of nothing. Yep. Nutritionally, it is not a replacement for the fat and the protein because you're getting one gram of protein for a cup of almond milk. You know, you're not getting anything regarding protein. Yeah. Um, you're also not getting anything regarding fat. I mean, all the front of the label is, is talking about how low fat it is. Well, that's not what we want. Yeah. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, yeah. So it's not nutritionally comparable in that regard. Okay. They yeah. They do add calcium and vitamin D back to it. Yeah. So when I have parents who are willing to go dairy free, but their main concern is the calcium mm-hmm. and vitamin D, uh-huh. which really is not a main concern, but that's another topic. Um, we can rest assured that the calcium and vitamin D is there. 
Uh -huh. and so when we still want to be able to get those in, that's where your replacement with almond milk and coconut milk is beneficial. It is okay. added back in in a synthetic, um, from a synthetic source. So it's not naturally occurring, mm -hmm. but it does get there somewhat to what a you know medium to low um, quality supplement would do. Um, so that's kind of the deal with the dairy alternatives. Okay. I think they are helpful. They are useful, especially in transition. Um, you know, I know some families who, especially with kids with sensory issues, um, who really detect new things or who have trouble with transitions, trouble with change. They detect mm -hmm. something new. Mm -hmm. um, I've known a mom who literally started with a teaspoon of almond milk in the child's regular dairy milk, and the child knew the difference. And wow. so she just kept giving that over and over, and eventually she moved up. You know, she just kept going, and eventually they were totally off the full dairy and the child had transitioned. But um, right. so helpful, but not overly nutritionally powerful by yeah. any means. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and the food pairing, um, I know Audra has probably spoken about this too, um, just with all the different things once you have gone through treatment that you, your children in our cases are now dealing with. Mm -hmm. And my son now, um, we're looking at, the way his body metabolizes food is different from another typical seven-year-old causing weight gain even if we're being careful. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my questions is food pairings. Um, for example, we had cut out um, processed sugar and then you know I hadn't really cut out a lot of fruits and you know now I'm cutting out certain fruits but as far as for a seven-year-old boy in my case um, what would be a good example of a food pairing with a fruit? Like, I was wondering, is it half an apple with maybe some nuts or that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, protein and carbohydrate together is the key with, with the fruit. So um, I try to steer people away from what I call naked carbs. So any carbs, whether it be fruit um, or grains or any carb that – is by itself is going to give you a faster insulin or faster blood sugar spike. Your insulin is going to come on board faster. Uh -huh. You're going to have the risk of storing that insulin um, that gets converted to fat if it's not utilized well. So especially mm -hmm. when you're looking at weight gain, keeping those blood sugars stable is the key. And so having a fat and or protein with that fruit is the key. So um, your example of half an apple and a handful of nuts is, is right on, especially for a seven-year-old. You know, that half an mm -hmm. apple is yeah. a total – that's an appropriate portion. You know, they don't need a whole apple unless they're, you know, little baseball yeah. size apples, you know. Yeah. But those are few and far between these days. So, And would um, that be a snack or would that be a meal? That would be a snack. Okay. That would absolutely be a snack. So half an apple with a nut butter, you know, a couple tablespoons of nut butter – or a handful of nuts, or, you know, sunflower seed butter, you know, the sun butters. Or um, if you're doing cheese, half an apple with, you know, with some cheese. Something mm -hmm. that gives you a carbohydrate and a protein together. Grapes okay. and cheese. Um, you know, it doesn't even have to necessarily make sense. If he likes both parts, they don't necessarily have to go together, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, always always put fruit with protein. Um it could even be deli meat or leftover meat from the night before. It doesn't have to be a typical snack food. You know, if anything, we want to get away from things that we consider snack foods and just use parts of other meals or smaller meals or, yes. you know, components of other real food products. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, you definitely want carbohydrate and protein paired together. Um, I know one dietitian who consistently uses – a two to one carb to protein ratio as uh, to keep people on track with that balance. Okay. So for every, for example, for every 30 grams of carbohydrate, it would be 15 grams of protein would need to be there. So a two to one carb to protein ratio. It's a little tricky to, to figure out. It's really probably not worth counting, you know, and going to the great lengths, but it is kind of a rule of thumb um, that you could kind of use if you wanted to get serious about those pairings. Um, but in general, carbon protein together is going to help buffer that blood sugar rise. Also keep the child feeling fuller a little bit longer so mm -hmm. their blood sugar is not shooting up, dropping down, and then they're moody and cranky and hungry again. Yeah. Blakely, does yeah. that um, also 
run for, for fat and also the fiber content of the carb. So if you have a high fiber carb and you got some fat with it and some protein with it, I remember when we were on um, more a diet that had a lot more carbs with it, if I had a nice fibrous something and I had fat with it and some protein, like I could stay full a good part of the, the day. I felt good. Right. But if I had like a bowl of oats, that's it. And you know, I was not just not just hungry 45 minutes later, but ravenous, like worse right. than when I had started. <laughs> and right. so it seemed like mm -hmm. there was a relationship in how quickly things, those carbs metabolize and convert, you know, and we get convert the glucose out of it um, and, and promote our insulin production um, with those other elements. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's exactly right. And that's really where it comes down to just trying to stay away from the processed, refined carbs as much as possible because they're just metabolized so much faster your blood sugar goes up and down that much more quickly. Um, so, you know, and so one example might be brown rice and, ri and white rice. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of brown rice. I don't think that the difference in brown rice and white rice is astronomical. Brown rice is going to have more fiber. Um, it also tends to have some more phytate sometimes too, which, you know, we don't digest well. So, what I would be doing with the rice, for example, is adding a lot of butter to that white rice, and so then you buffer that insulin spike with the butter, with the fat okay. from the butter. Sounds and good. Then, yeah. See, yeah. That's, that's All right. 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 Like, There's something to be said for that wisdom of like a huge pat of butter on that piece of bread, you know? Right. Or exactly. my Italian relatives like soaking it in olive oil, like sucking mm -hmm. the olive oil out of it, you yeah. know? Right. So true. That fat is again one of those buffers, and so. Um, your fiber content of your grains is going to help you metabolize slower. It is going to keep you fuller longer. I don't really ever focus too much on it because by the time we get to the carb level that we really need to be eating anyway to manage blood sugars well, the fiber content isn't going to make or break the deal. You know, if for people who are eating a lot of carbs and a lot of refined carbs and they switch to whole grains or switch to higher fiber carbs, yeah, it can be beneficial. But most of the time we're looking more towards getting our carbohydrates from fruit, um, mm -hmm. which we want to eat whole and not in juice form, rather than our grains. So, you know, regardless of the situation, we're probably lightening up on the grains anyway. And so the fiber conversation kind of is a little bit of a wash. Um, as long as we've got that, that protein and fat as the buffer. So oatmeal, for example. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's you can get gluten-free oats. Um, a lot of people still do fine with regular oats. They're technically gluten-free, but there's a lot of cross-contamination with oats. So um, if you are gluten-free, go for the gluten-free oats. But, you know, oatmeal, for example, like Audra mentioned, you know, you eat just a plain bowl of oats in 45 minutes. Well, 45 minutes might be generous. I mean, 30 minutes later, <laughs> you're hungry. Um, but the solution would be possibly a slightly smaller portion of oats but either stir in a couple tablespoons of peanut butter and make that, call that peanut butter oatmeal, or load it up with nuts, or have an egg with your oatmeal, or have a couple pieces of deli meat with your oatmeal. You know, have a smaller portion of oatmeal and add on a little bit of, you know, an additional protein source, again, as that buffer, versus considering oatmeal the, the star of the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. It's helpful. Yeah. Good. Do you want me to ask my next question, Andre, or do you want to go to another one? It's yeah. we Lately, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. We can go. We can go to eight thirty since we got started late. That's fine. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to push you too far. Let's go. Yeah, let's go with with any uh -huh. any more questions that you have, Erin, and then we'll schedule another time for those Great. other questions if you're cool with that, Blakely. Perfect. Thanks Love so it. much, Blakely. Um, mm -hmm. I think the last question that that comes to mind is um, sweetener. Mm -hmm. So in cooking. Um, you know, there's, you know, unrefined or sugar that's whole or, or in its natural, most natural state we can have it. Was it called sec? I forget what it's called. But, um, or honey yeah. or, yeah. yeah, honey. I just, sometimes I'm not, just not sure what to do. Um, mm -hmm. If we use what sweetener, what kind, and how much, and should it be an absolute yeah. special treat? Yeah. So. I think with kids, um, I think it's important to look at how they're culturally 
experiencing food, what's the food culture happening around the house and around their friends and around their environment, uh -huh. where it's tempting to restrict um, sweet things to the level that I think long term can create some more problems than it might be yeah. worth nutritionally. Yeah. Um, I say that coming from an eating disorder background with a sister who's an eating disorder therapist and who sees a lot of teenagers whose parents were very restrictive and yeah. very clean, whole food eating people when they were younger yeah. and backfiring as teenagers. So I don't say that because we want to be fearful of that happening. I think the right conversations and the right connection with your family, with your kids can be happening around those things, but yeah. just that simply to restrict because we're going to do this perfectly um, can override the well-being of that child. So I think the amount of sweets and treats um, is just moderated, you know. It's not something that necessarily needs to happen every day. It's not something that needs to be the expectation as part of every meal. But for celebrations, you know, when we're doing birthdays and you're doing um, those culturally significant celebrations that are going to include sweet things, let's figure out how to get better versions of those. But for report cards, for making your bed, for, you know, the general day-to-day -day rewards, don't use food as reward. So right. you were so great today. Let's have brownies. You, if you listen, we'll get a treat at the store. You know, if, if you're really good in the grocery store, then you can pick a treat before you leave. Don't use food as rewards, but use, but celebrate well with those culturally um, naturally occurring things that are yeah. going to include your sweets. So that's kind of the paradigm of um, that I come from as far as balance and wanting kids to still be kids and experience life and not miss out on things that are going to matter socially and developmentally for them. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, as far as which sweetener, um, I would definitely lean towards your honey, your maple syrup, and your molasses. Each of those three are naturally occurring that are going to have beneficial elements to them. So your um, each of those have minerals in them inherently that are going to be, that actually add some level of nutritive value um, versus your stevia and your, refined, your unrefined cane sugar, your organic sugar. Mm -hmm. They have their place and their purpose. Sometimes you need them when you're making that birthday cake or you're making those cupcakes um, to take – you know, to the family event because there's going to be, you know, regular cupcakes or, you know, when you're making your gluten-free things, you know, I've got organic um, brown sugar in my pantry. I've got organic, um, reg you know, sugar in my pantry. Um, but when I'm trying to do most sweets, even with making like a milkshake or popsicles, you know, we'll do some chocolate fudge sickles. Mm -hmm. They will be honey and almond milk and cocoa and vanilla, you know, Heat that up on the stove, get it all dissolved and melted, pour it in your popsicle molds, and you've got fabulous fudge sickles. Mm -hmm. um, so I lean towards the honey, the maple syrup, and the molasses for, for your sweeteners when possible. Um, coconut sugar um, and coconut nectar are also helpful um, yeah. sweeteners. Um, the coconut sugar is, again, has minerals that are beneficial. It also is proving to have a little bit slower blood sugar rise. It's a little mm -hmm. bit easier on the metabolism than those other granulated sugars. Mm -hmm. um, both of those are more expensive, but when you're using them in moderation anyway, you can mm -hmm. probably get by with, with using it a little bit. Um, I haven't used the coconut sugar in any baked goods. When I've done mm -hmm. some special occasion you know, gluten-free baking, mm -hmm. I haven't ever substituted the coconut sugar um, for my organic um, sugar, so I don't know how that would work, but when you smell it and taste it, it's a little bit stronger flavor. Um, there's a paleo toffee recipe that's out there that uses coconut nectar um, that's a liquid form that um, is a really fun, you know, kind of caramely type hmm. treat. Hmm. Um, avocado chocolate pudding that would use maple syrup or honey as the sweetener um, is a great treat to try. The base of it is avocado, and then you add honey um, and cocoa and sometimes a nut butter or a squirt of lemon or some vanilla to kind of boost those flavors and kind of brighten it up a little bit. Uh -huh. um, and that is, you know, blended is the fabulous pudding. 
you know. Um, there's also a recipe out there that is I'm trying to think of the brownie, what the basis of the brownie recipe is that I've used. Then he has it. Um, but yeah. other than that, we do use a formulation of erythritol and stevia. Um, erythritol yeah. is still, I mean, it's still processed, but it's derived from fermenting glucose. And mm -hmm. the outcome of that is what you find in fermented foods and things like that. We actually produce it in our body as well. So we use that. Um, we use it in our shakes. We make fat, raspberry fat shakes in the morning with coconut mm -hmm. cream and ice and some raspberries and Z-Sweet. We use it in, a, in the chocolate pudding we make and all that stuff. And so for anybody who might be on a specialized diet like that who is actually in the position to have to cut these things, then um, that's been a really amazing alternative for us. And the research for the safety and efficacy of erythritol is really compelling. Um, it may not have the, like, minerals. You know, it all depends on what your, your yeah. goal is, right? right? And so our goal most specifically with the type of cancer our son has and the, and the glycolytic nature of that, so on and so forth, you know, spin based on Aaron's questions. And your knowledge yeah, is so it. thorough and in-depth. And I learned so much from this. Yeah. So Good. grateful for it. So I'm hoping you can join us on another day that we could arrange to now that we've experimented with today. Yeah. And maybe we can address some of those questions from the from the Facebook because you expound so much on these principles and your mm -hmm. knowledge is so thorough. And not just that, you have such a wonderfully pragmatic and reasonable approach that, you know, if this is a case about. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so so much. fun. Great okay. to meet you, Erin. Great to meet you, too. <laughs> Great to see you, Blakely. And I'm going to end the broadcast, but I think we might still just have a moment to talk after I end Perfect. the broadcast. So okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.